four gentlemen accompanying me this afternoon. Um, on my right hand side is Michael Ellis. Uh, Michael is uh, President and Managing Director of the Asia Pacific Region for the Motion Pictures Association and Mokjun Picture Association International. Uh, a specialist in facilitating industry government cooperation worldwide and has successfully forged uh, strategic partnership and alliances that promote and protect commercial and creative interests in Asia screen communities, in, especially in this di digital age. Um, prior to this, uh, Michael has a distinguished career in the British and Royal Hong Kong Police and rose to the rank of superintendent and had the honor of being the aide de camp to the last governor of Hong Kong and joined MPAA in 1999, uh, an authority on copyright law and IPR in Asia Pacific. Um, he's also an adjunct lecturer uh, at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Um, to my left is Chris Brown, producer from Australia in Pictures in Paradise. Chris Brown uh, lives and works between Australia, UK, uh, Los Angeles, and New York. He has produced films like The Company of Wolves, Mona Lisa, which is the winner of the Golden Globe Awards plus Oscar nomination, um, uh, Absolute Beginners, and The Proposition and Daybreakers. In 2011, um, Chris executive produced Bait 3D, uh, the first 3D action movie in Australia and the first Singaporean co-production with Australia. And most recently, he just completed the film called The Railway Man, uh, which stars Colin Firth, Nicole Kidman, and Stellan Skarsgård. Um, he's currently working with Ed Pressman to produce a, a re-imaging the classic action film Bloodsport. And, um, directed by James McTeague, who directed V for Vendetta. So we're going to learn a lot about, um, you know, incentive in Australia from Chris. And to the left of Chris is uh, Norman Alim, um, executive vice president of KRU Group Malaysia. Uh, Norman has basically produced 20 films to date, uh, four international films, uh, the Monday, Monday Chronicle, Deadline, Vikingdom, and the, le the latest one was Ribbit. Um, he has been recognized with the Outstanding Entrepreneur Award in 2007 from the Asia Pacific Entrepreneur Awards and basically has propelled his company to the forefront of media entertainment industry. Um, KRU also basically operate a 15-acre studio uh, with two sound stages in in Malaysia. And the last gentleman is uh, Mike Wiluan, CEO of Infinite Studios Singapore. Mike has produced uh, Sing to the Dawn and also collaborate with Singapore director um, Eric Ku on My Magic, Be With Me, as well as uh, Tatsumi, which was in Cannes Film Festival, and also produced uh, Dara, uh, an Indonesian horror film produced by the Mo Brothers um, and also uh, film 2359 which became the second highest box office crossing local film in 2011 in Singapore. And Infinite Studios works with key partnerships like HBO, Chorus Group, Mark Burnett and Discovery Networks Asia Pacific. So please welcome the four gentlemen. So with this session, I'm going to start with uh, Mike Ellis first, and Mike will basically give us an overall overview about incentive, and then uh, afterwards I will go to Chris Norman and Mike Wiluan. And then at the, at the end, I'm going to open the floor for questions from, from the audience. Terrific, Shanti, thank you very much. If you just put up the slides, and I will quickly go through and give you a macro overview, and then narrow it down to um, Asia Pacific. Um, it's all about the business. Um, in America, obviously, you know, the studios I represent have lots of options in America where they can make their films with terrific incentives all across America and the many states. Um, and the reason why 
states will get involved in this is because it just brings more money into that particular state. If you look at sort of three, three particular countries, sorry, states I've pulled up there, in New York, a 30% tax credit, 28,000 jobs created in 2011. And North Carolina, um, a huge multi-million dollar spend brought in as well as jobs being created. And also, you know, in every other state across America, Productions means money and means a multiplier of spend going into that particular state. Now, out here in Asia Pacific, um, it's a mixed bag. Um, there are a number of countries which are at the forefront of making sure production incentives are available to everybody. Um, and then there are countries which really focus on local industry and make sure there are incentives for the local industry. And then um, there are, on top of that, a number of countries where there actually isn't anything at all. So we've got a real mixed bag. And of course, where there are incentives, um, the filmmakers will go and make their films. And when there are not, uh, the chances are somewhat reduced. So in looking at that, you know, at the end of the day, it means a huge dollar um, amount being spent on the economy and the GDP contribution you know, in those countries is huge, as well as the number of people being employed. In the red is the, the billion dollar contribution to the GDP, and in the orange per country is how many people are engaged in that film industry in that country. I, I, I do not propose, obviously, to go through those. Um, but if we look at sort of three countries in particular, the gold class, Australia, um, a huge producer's offset, 40%, um, post-production offset, 30%, or a location offset of 16%. Now, you might say, add those all up together and you've got a nice 86% contribution. Well, no, you've got to pick one of them. That said, um, it's still an attractive place, clearly, to make films, obviously well-trained uh, technicians involved, and also an amazing location. Having said that, um, the strong Australian dollar makes it slightly less attractive. Um, but, you know, when a production goes into that country, the contribution, obviously, is huge, and it's not just the Leonardo DiCaprio's that, that actually make the money, but you know the, the, the smaller photograph is a hat maker, um, and you can imagine on a period piece like The Great Gatsby, you know the costumes and hats that were being made just pulls in huge numbers um, uh, of employment options as well as revenue being created. Um, and more recently, you've now got the film um, 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 with, you know, with Angelique Jolly being made, which is unbroken, which looks to be just an amazing film. So we're excited to see the numbers coming out of there. And then close at home, you look at Malaysia, uh, with Pinewood Studios going in, um, terrific 30% cash rebate being offered for productions made there. Um, and even closer at home here in Singapore, 40% um, <coughs> productions assistant grant scheme is available, and the new talent feature grants as well. So, you know, close to home, um, there are these options, and we're looking forward to hearing from the panel exactly how some of these work. Um, we're on a short time frame. We've only got 45 minutes of the whole thing, so I've jammed through this, but I'm looking forward to hearing from the esteemed panel and participating in the panel. With that, let me take my seat back. Thank you, Mike. So, from um, your presentation, we see so many different basically types of incentive. I mean, as a producer, you know, you, you talk about uh, rebates, you know, grants, and there's so many different types. There's tax credits we were discussing with uh, Chris earlier, was like, and sometimes it's quite confusing which one is which, and we need to understand uh, uh, which one. Maybe I'll, I'll start with Chris first. Um, there's a 40% offset here in Australia, and so, you basically have a lot of experience in, in utilizing this offset. And can you basically you know, give a, an example of how it works and how do you match it with other uh, financing, production financing, and also uh, maybe with you know, Asian uh, uh, incentive? Um, <coughs> well, it's, uh, it, it's, it is a huge subject, so uh, I shall kind of be brief. And um, to the point, firstly, there is not just a 40% rebate. That's the other thing is that in, in Australia, we're very, very lucky because we have the 40% rebate for films which qualify as 100% Australian. And the money that qualifies for that 40% is what they call QUAIP, Qualifying uh, Australian produ Production Expenditure. 
That means anything which is spent in Australia or on an Australian element. Obviously there is what I call good spend and there is bad spend. Bad spend is anything to do with the bank or paying interest or that kind of thing. You know, good spend is the crew and everything to do with shooting the movie, but anything to do with financial services is not included. So I suppose you could say that the real benefit of, the, of that rebate is about 32 to 34% net. On top of that, you've then got um, a number of other areas of investment which aren't necessary, and they aren't necessarily rebates or um, you know, tax rebates or even grants. But what they are is an ability to actually be able to make a film. Firstly, if it is also an Australian film or an official co-production, and that's a key element of this conversation because I'm sitting here in Singapore and I did make the first Singaporean co-production and the only way we were able to do that is, is, is actually because we use the treaty between the two countries because when you make a film under the treaty it means it qualifies as 100% Australian and 100% Singapore which means that you can access the benefits from both countries. So just rewinding back for a second, the other incentives that you have in Australia well, let's just take Queensland, because you have state-by-state state incentives, is that in Queensland, for instance, you have a payroll tax rebate, which, bearing in mind the amount of tax we have to pay in Australia, is absolutely heavily. Uh, on top of that, the state itself actually puts up a certain amount of equity into the film if a certain percentage of it is shot in Queensland, or Victoria, or South Australia, or Sydney. All these areas have an additional amount of equity to that can actually be invested. On top of that, yes, it gets better. Um, on top of that, you also have um, an equity, a federal equity fund, which is competitive. So you have to go in there against all the other films that are there, but you can get up to an additional $2 million worth of investment from the government into your film. But it has to be an Australian film, it has to deal with Australian issues, etc., etc., etc. So, you know, what is the point of all this apart from actually getting as much money as you possibly can? Well, the point of it is, is to raise and leverage the money that you have. And the way that you leverage the money you have so that you can produce a movie which is going to compete on the open market with the Americans is to go into partnership with a country which has a treaty with your country so that they can access their rebates, put them together with the ones you got, and you know you can make a film for 15 to 20 million dollars which can compete with the American market, can be released in the major territories and actually have a chance of, of actually you know, taking a very, very prominent place on the world stage. And that in a kind of um, rather roundabout way is uh, summed it up, I think. Um, just an additional uh, question, question, Chris, before I move to Norman. Um, you uh, participate in Bait 3D. Uh, was that was the project that basically uh, first co-production between Singapore and Australia? So how what was the experience of matching the the tax incentive? What works? Well, the, the the key to that whole thing is really is well, firstly there there is um, co-production is all about partnership, and partnership is like marriage. It really is. If you have a bad marriage, you will live to regret it for the rest of your life. If you go into business with somebody that you really don't trust or you really don't like, you are going to live to regret it for the rest of your life, believe me. So the first thing is to find somebody that you trust and you want to work with. And, and also, the, the second part of that is that you need to have somebody who knows exactly what they're doing and exactly how the incentives work. And then what you do is you basically have a government-to-government -government treaty where you can actually form a relationship with another uh, uh, company in another country and work within the guidelines which are provided by the government to access those two different kinds of rebates, which give you the bedrock and the foundation stone for actually building a production. Um, Norman, um, so Malaysia basically introduced this 30% uh, um, incentive um, as a Malaysian producer, how, how do you plan to basically take advantage of this now that it's available and it's, uh, it's activated? Uh, the incentive was launched earlier this year, yeah. so it's pretty new. Uh, and the good thing about Malaysia is that 30% is actually is, is a very low uh, minimum criteria for the Malaysian spend. 
Uh, for foreign productions, uh, it's 5 million ringgit, which works out to be roughly about 1.7 million US dollars uh, for, for minimum spend in Malaysia. And for local films, uh, it's half of that. It's roughly about $750,000 US, and you'll be able to qualify for that 30% rebate. Um, and it does, does help, because right now on average, the Malaysian film uh, for the local consumption, because Malaysia is pretty small in terms of uh, the uh, domestic box, uh, box office market, uh, we can see now producers trying to raise the bar and try to actually, you know, do better quality productions and put more money into the production and give more production value for the, uh, in the film that, films that they make. And uh, another positive thing about this incentive in Malaysia is that our cost of living is generally cheaper than most countries when compared to Australia or even Singapore. Uh, the exchange rate is one third of U the US dollar. So not only you get at 30%, but generally, the cost of things that, you know, the, the, the bad incentive you mentioned is now that cost that you spend on hotels or even transportation. I mean, when we, we produce a film in Malaysia with, with Hollywood cast, uh, a five-star hotel, you know, we can do a package of $50 US per night. So this is, this is, this is, this is actually the kind of uh, benefits uh, of filming in Malaysia, apart from the vast choice of locations. And I, can, I, I think that with, with the... Uh, with the existence of Pinewood Studios and a few other studios in Malaysia, uh, you can see the skills being upgraded as we get more and more opportunities. The local crew will get more exposure and over a period of time, I think we'll be very competitive. Can you also um, elaborate a little bit uh, about, because you have four uh, films um, in your repertoire, uh, Five Kingdom and Ribbit. Can you, was that also uh, made under because you mentioned there's also other incentive before the thirty yeah. percent was um, introduced. Yes. Um, so was that under? Can I talk about my the incentive I got uh, in Louisiana? Sure. <laughs> okay, I shot a film in Louisiana and it's got the twenty five percent rebate. Uh, but I was this, this film that we made in Louisiana is called Deadline and we got the late Bernie Murphy to act in the movie. It was back in two thousand and nine, and it was our very first experience getting any kind of production incentive. But we didn't realize that you know, we were exposed to a lot of union regulations. So it escalated the price from original budget of $1.5 million, it went up to $2.4 million. It was supposed to be just about four people in a haunted house, and that's it. You know? It cost a lot of money to shoot there. And, and, and the union impact actually affected uh, you know, the, the entire project. And the good thing about in Malaysia, uh, right now, there's no such thing as having a union uh, rule. On, on the hours, it's I think pretty flexible because we work with a local crew and they pretty much are flexible with their time. Um, and talking about the, 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 the incentives that we enjoyed in the past, a movie called My Kingdom is actually was shot in Malaysia and we got uh, about roughly about 700,000 US dollars in terms of uh, the visual effects grant. So it's actually a grant uh, to do the visual effects. Of course, the cost of visual effects is double in that, but at least we get some money back for that. Unfortunately, that film was shot in 2011, so we didn't actually qualify to get the, uh, the rebate of the 30%. Whereas there's another grant uh, that was uh, offered by uh, MDEC. The first one is actually uh, FINAS. The 30% rebate is FINAS. It's actually the National Film Development Corporation of Malaysia. The other one is MDEC. When we did this animation movie, uh, they encourage co-production. So it's a co-production grant. It's called Mac3 Co-Pro Grant. Uh, and, and the objective is for Malaysian companies to go into co-production with uh, established players outside of Malaysia to actually create content for the global market. And that is also a grant. But I think the government is trying to you know, do away with all those uh, grants kind of concept uh, and, and to, to, to encourage real players to, to start investing in content. Hence why they, we have the 30% rebate. So you get that money back you know, within six months after you complete production. Um, Mike Willow, um, you just co-produced um, uh, Serangoon Road uh, with HBO and I think it's also a co-production with Australia. Um, how did you put together and how do you structure uh, that series um, with incentives in mind? Um, well, just overall it was an incredibly complicated process because it was a treaty co-pro and we had so many parts, we had two broadcasters involved, we also had uh, content film, our distributor involved as well, 
and uh, it was shot in a country that technically was a non-treaty country, Indonesia, um, given the fact that we had uh, money coming from uh, Australia and Singapore, which was treaty based. So it was incredibly complicated and, um, to, and also the nature of the project kept on changing as well. Budgets were fluctuating and we were just trying to catch up with it. Um, it, it, it was incredibly um, complicated, mainly because of the fact that um, I think you know that the project was much more ambitious than originally was envisaged. But I think there was an incredible value of being able to um, look at a nature of project, like for example, uh, like t television. You know, because you know, unlike feature films, you do need to have an offtake of a network being involved to take. The, the project forward um, and um, having both HBO Asia and ABC Australia was, was great and having them being able to you know get together and, and decide what they want to do creatively was great. Um, we had um, an incredible participation from MDA um, and uh, we, we um, you know are as you know our incentive scheme from MDA is relatively new we get around 40% of qualifying Singapore spend. And what was interesting was that, um, you know, our studios over in Batam, Indonesia, um, was less important as opposed to the talent moving across there to, to, to produce the project. So it's less about the location and more about the Singaporeans involved and the companies that are involved. Um, and that it gave us a lot more flexibility because if you just look at it on the hard and fast rule, then you know there's a lot of things that potentially couldn't qualify as well. And I think we always had to make that argument. Um, I think um, in terms of one of the challenges that we also faced um, with an ambitious project and with you know ambitious projects, you have also you know fluctuations of cash flows and change of budgets. You know, it's the milestone payments in which everyone comes in. So if you have pretty much five partners cash flowing the production um, and everyone signed an agreement to basically cash flow at certain points and suddenly the schedule changes. No one wants to change it back and you know at the end of the day the production company has to suffer um, <laughs> tremendously. I mean I'm being incredibly positive right now, you know, my, my nightmare is over. Um, but you know it's, uh, you know, whatever it is, the, the lead up to the paperwork is incredibly complicated. Right, and I think one needs to give time for it to happen. Um, and I think um, sometimes the, there is a slight inflexibility um, when you're looking at projects that are a little bit more ambitious in terms of a series that had never been done before. But overall, we finished it, we completed it, and I think we realized the virtues of, of certainly working with, you know, especially on the treaty side between Australia and, and Singapore. So, um, before I go to you, I just have uh, one question for the three of you. So, you know, I heard about the, the, the pro of basically accessing all these uh, possibilities and finance, but again, also there are challenges in terms of, you know, administration, juggling all, you know, partners. So, what is, what, what, re what works and what can be better in, based on your, um, experience? Well, I think for me, um, certainly we've come a long way in terms of from Singapore's perspective. I mean, as a company, we are in Indonesia and Singapore. Indonesia doesn't have an incentive program right now, as you know, we're trying to make that happen. But I think that's still a long way off. And I think one of the virtues still of Indonesia is relatively high production value for an, at an economical rate. I think it's very comparative to um, what Norman's saying about Malaysia, there's that similarity there. But, you know, Singapore's incentive system has come a long way. Um, it started out as sort of like sovereign equity with strings attached, to, all the way to loan guarantee facilities, and today it's a straightforward, you know, grant system. Um, but I think one of the challenges is always the fact that, you know, you, one always needs to, you know, look at the opportunities from, I always feel, as an industry op growth opportunity. Right. I mean, so there are certain projects that come in, which might not necessarily be sort of like on the on the high level an intellectual property um, sort of like ownership deal in which you know Singaporean companies don't necessarily get to own or be involved with, but as a facility we get to service 
very uh, high quality work or, or, or so on and so forth. So my challenge, I mean, I guess the, the, the question is at some point, um, there was a questioning on the incentive program whether it should be more targeted to high value kind of projects in which companies get to have a share of the intellectual property too. I, do, I disagree with that. You know, I, I feel that an incentive program should be very much based on uh, growing the industry and whether it's services or intellectual property, it should be applied to both, right? And I think right now there is a question as to whether this incentive program would potentially continue forward in the same guise, which is, you know, it should. It means that anyone can access it, right? Anyone in any company, as long as you're able to prove the qualifying Singapore spec. I think any more additional hurdles to that is going gonna, is gonna to dent the industry. So it will be good if it carries on like that. So, Chris, so what can be better from... Um, I mean, always flexibility is, um, you know, the thing. Um, it's not so much with the incentives, to be honest with you. It's more to do with the treaties. The treaties are very kind of, very kind of straight jacketing, and there's not that much flexibility. I, I, in fact, I really agree with what Mike's saying. I, I, I totally believe that to get, you know, what what we need to do is, you know, as as countries which are outside, you know, the beast, the great American beast, is to, is to have a way of coming together so that we can make films which can compete in the market. And that's why the whole concept of co-production was invented, was really as a balance against the American market so that we can be competitive with them. So what we need to do, anything, I think the answer to that is, it's a very difficult question to answer because you actually have to get specific to say what what you need to do, but the reality of it is, is that we need to create a critical mass as individual nations to make as many films as we, as we possibly can. What Mike was just saying is absolutely right, is we don't need any more qualifying things. That's what we don't need, that's for sure, because it's hard enough to hit the, hit the criteria we have, because what we need is we need to make a lot of films, a lot of films, because we, you learn from your mistakes. You don't learn from your successes, you learn from your mistakes. The more mistakes you're able to make, the better films you end up making. Because, you know, you don't make those mistakes again. Because <laughs> it's so terrifying when you do. You are never going to make those mistakes again. And actually, the funny enough, I always think that, you know, it's co-production is rather like childbirth, you know. You know, at the end of it, you have this thing that you love and you cherish and you adore. But quite honestly, if you could remember, all the extreme pain you went through to get to that point, you'd never ever do it again. So, um, as I said, the main thing for me is, you know, let's get ourselves in a position where we have more flexibility in, in the treaties so that we can actually, and it is very difficult, the treaties are very, very difficult to manage. It's not impossible, but they are difficult to manage. More flexibilities in the treaties. Keep the criteria very basic in terms of, you know, qualifying, and all those kind of things for the, for the rebates. And on that basis, we can then create a critical mass which will produce the number of movies, which will give us an industry in all, our, in all of our countries, which will then give us an ability to make our stories in the way that we want to. Okay. So, Mike, um, taking off what Chris was saying, do you think, um, like, with all the incentives now in, in Asia, do you, are you confident that will this basically will grow the local industry? I think it's work in progress. Um, I, I think that's what you're hearing from the panel. If you look at somewhere like the Australia model, you know, the Great Gatsby, a, a terrific Hollywood value production, 120 million invested, but brought into New South Wales around $340 million of spend, employed 1,000 people, of which 200 people were extras. I mean, that's a huge boost to the local economy, but more importantly, a skill transfer set where you have expertise coming in. I, I, and equally a learning experience um, for, the, you know, for the, the Hollywood people coming in on that set as well. But if you translate that across to other markets, there are learnings going both ways. But I do think it's work in progress. But hopefully the numbers alone will drive the desire to do this. Uh, because at the end of the day, making a movie is incredibly expensive. Um, Chris alluded to the, the sheer pain of doing it. Um, but the beauty of getting a product at the end, which you're very proud of and you, you've accomplished it, and you're even happier if you can make some money off the back of it. Um, so Bait was a great example of a movie which you know, did incredibly well up in China. 
Um, you know, and, and with Norman now taking his movies, not just in making them in Malaysia, but making international movies that will be played all over the world. I mean, Ribbit, you know, his latest animation um, has the ability to be played in every market throughout the world where are the cinemas. Um, you know, and, and I think that's the vision that you've got to have, but doing it at a, a production perceived value that is huge, but done at a local cost. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough game. Um, and I think any incentives that can be um, brought to the, the table that will make people bring the, the product in at a cost that can make a profit um, has to be encouraged. Uh, the markets in Asia where we don't have that, um, we'd love to see them. We'd love there to be a choice where filmmakers and producers can pick not only the location, but also where the expertise is, and of course, where they can make the film they want to make from a censorship point of view. Um, so there's a lot of criteria that, that certainly go in. Picking up what Mike was saying, um, so because everybody talking about oh Malaysia with the new uh, incentive, so I think the problem that we have now in Malaysia is that we don't actually have any treaty outside of Malaysia. Mm. I think if only we have, I think we in, in negotiations right now with Australia and also Singapore. Uh, I wish there's more in these ASEAN countries, ASEAN countries to actually do similar incentives so that we can create an ASEAN market. So if there's anything that is happening out of Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, these are important countries in ASEAN that would actually need to introduce such programs. And, and with these incentives will allow more co-production activities to start to materialize. And we can see, we can see or create an ASEAN market. Uh, of course, not forgetting Australia as well. I'd like to have uh, Australia to be plus Australia. <laughs> ASEAN and Australia. So the thing is, you know, because we don't actually have the, the population. I mean, Malaysia alone has only got 30 million people. The thing is, uh, we need to actually create this, 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 this market in, in this region. And if we can uh, make our content travel at least in ASEAN territory plus Australia, it will actually allow us uh, to, to compete at a global level in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a much better position to compete with the global players. Uh, it, it's really interesting you're saying that, actually, because I, I was in... Um Brazil last year, and in South America, they have a kind of preferential co-production agreement for the whole of South America, which works for, you know, Brazil, if it wants to do a co-production with Colombia, at like, or a tripartite co-production with Colombia and Chile. Um, it, it's much, much easier to do that than it is to do one with Europe, for instance. So that's something they do all the time, and the paperwork is very, very basic, and it, it just really encourages a kind of unity of purpose for the, for the entire region. And, and it's great because there's such an amazing exchange of ideas and talent. And it really is a kind of economic generator for the region. It's, it's very, very, very clever. And that's something that, you know, it's a really good idea. And it's really good. It's something that should definitely go on the agenda for Asia. It really should. We need to convince Indonesia to, <laughs> to basically also have an incentive. Okay, so we already have some questions from the audience. I'm going to um, read the first one. What are, for all of you, so what are the most efficient incentive your company have benefited from? Start with Mike. Efficient incentives. Um, gosh, okay. Um, the process certainly isn't efficient, I can tell you that. Um, but I would say, you know, look, you know, we've been a, a, a recipient of a number of incentives uh, from the MDA, right, the Singapore government here. And, you know, as, you know, what I'd say is that the incentives system right now is becoming better because I guess we're a familiar face to them, right, and we know the process. Um, so, I guess a new incentive system can never be efficient at the beginning. It has to evolve from time to time. And it's important to have the administrators of the incentive to be very um, in tune with the nature of the industry in terms of what's happening. You can't just think of it on, on a sort of like a, a, a single territory and say, look, this is our policy and we don't care what happens around the world. Well, what happens around the world should um, evolve the incentive further and actually should um, take advantage of the fact that ultimately what's happening in the US right now is a great opportunity for Asia to take advantage of, right? And so those incentives um, should evolve. Um, I believe the more we use those incentives, the more efficient they'll become because ultimately those administering the incentives will not 
look at every single project like it's a customized thing and start from start to finish. You know, everyone should know how to apply. Everyone should know what fixes the criteria. I mean, just even going through qualifying Singapore spend and, and defining what is qualifying and what is not. You know, ultimately, you know, there's an argument all the time about what qualifies and what doesn't. But, you know, the more we do it, um, you know, the better it's going to become. So it will be more efficient. I don't think there is one ultimate efficient sort of like system. I believe other countries that have been involved more with administering the system would, would probably be more efficient in their own way. But the nature of those incentives are different. I would say that at least the benefit right now from the uh, MDA incentives is that those incentives cash flow our production, right? Which is a huge advantage. I and mean, we, we have 85% upfront to cash flow our production. And we only have to sort of like, you know, consider the 15% as withholding. And that's a huge advantage over the rebates and everything else that we have around the world. So, you know, you, you've got to kind of, you know, balance it out in the end, pros and cons. Right, but it's always evolving, right? And we just hope it doesn't stay static in one point, rather. You mentioned the, <laughs> the surprise when you mentioned the example in Louisiana. That was a challenge. So there was this element of surprise suddenly. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I mean, all the countries around the world, I mean, you've got to actually read the, the fine lines, you know, every country has got their own set of rules and regulations. I think we made the mistake of not knowing that, even though we had an American co-production partner who's actually, who actually said that we can go non-union, but obviously when you have a star like Brittany Murphy, the next thing you know, it actually gets published in Hollywood Reporter that she's filming in Louisiana and things start to happen, right? So I think, I think that the, the most efficient incentive, I still think the, the rebate system is good. Uh, I think what Mike said about cash flowing would be great help for producers because you, know, you don't see the money until you complete the film, you know? So I think that, that it's still, it's still going to be driven based on this uh, rebate system. I think that's the best way. Rather than giving grants to people and sometimes you don't really get to see the project being completed and stuff like that. So it's better to do this. But at the same time, what would be good, uh, some sort of financial instrument that can actually support the cash flow of the production as we proceed with the production. Yes, I think one of the benefits of I mean, the offset, um, the rebate system in Australia, the offset, producer's offset, um, has worked extremely well in Australia. And the reason why is for two reasons. Is firstly, it's, um, it's made it available to everybody. There's a kind of universality about it. Anybody, as long as they, they can qualify for half a million dollars worth of expenditure, can access it. There is no cap to it. But what it's also done is actually it's, it's promoted an entrepreneurial environment which did not exist before. You know, going to the government with your handout and um, getting grants and things like that, rather than having to go out, find a bank, negotiate a rate of loan for a loan. Uh, this is how it works in Australia. You have to go and find a financial institution, and there are now quite a few of them, but you have to negotiate the loan of that money from that institution to cash flow the rebate. You have to get a firm of accountants to give you a letter which says exactly how much you're going to get back from the rebate. You know, all these things have actually promoted a completely different environment of filmmaking which is much more in, in, entrepreneurial as opposed to government dependent. And you know, the government is always, um, uh, I was going to say whining, that sounds a bit bad, doesn't it? are always complaining about the fact that, you know, producers are always standing around there. You know, they never do anything, they don't know how to run a business and all those kind of things. Well, I think what the offset's done in Australia, for sure, is, is to turn us all into, much more into businessmen, which is, what, which is great, which, is, which means that we have the opportunity to show them that we do, it is a show business, you know, it is show business. So, you know, it shows that, um, and also gives us the opportunity to, to match other funds with that, uh, and it, it creates a proper environment you know, for, for business to be done and for, the, for business to expand. And I think that's what's been so great about the, the offset. Next question, I'm going to start with you. So do you have data to illustrate how production incentives actually stimulate the industry growth? And how does it affect the numbers, does, or does it affect the numbers of ticket sales or audience? Is there an extreme correlation, or is this 
Yeah, I, I think it comes in many ways. I mean, the Australia one was a great example. Um, the stats I put up on New York is another. But it also stimulates new business off the back of it. Um, if you think about you know, New York, there are now, I think, two or three different companies that run um, tourist events going to various locations where films have been set. Yeah, a brand new industry coming off the back of the film industry. Um, so there's that added benefit that comes in when you have a vibrant you know, economy. Um, around the film industry. And, um, you know, I think everywhere in the States, you know, if you watch many of the films now, many of them shot down in New Orleans. Uh, and again, new companies coming in. So, um, you know, skill sets get improved. And I'd like to see the same happening here, here in Asia. Clearly, in Australia, the skill set is there. And I think Malaysia has a great opportunity for, you know, you've got Norman of your KLU vocational school or academy. You know, you've got young graduates coming through. And the same, Mike, with yours, you know, you've got people who've got the skill set. Um, and you've got the facilities. So one would hope that off the back of that, more business will be generated. So Mike, um, does it really basically, because you're working on you know, both Indonesia and Singapore, does it really you know, stimulate more production or interest to you know, work with you in tapping you know, both markets? Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, incentives are always going to be welcome. Right, in, in any case, right? And um, look, the, the, the first thing that producers ask when you're talking about a movie is now incentives, really. I think the location comes second in most cases, right? Because, you know, they, they always can be rewritten. Um, but the incentives really are, are the primary uh, discussion topic today. And, um, and when those incentives are effective, we really do see, uh, again, the whole industry develop. I mean, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about sort of like peripheral industries develop. I mean, for us, um, what we've done here in Singapore is that we've built um, film studios together with an office complex here in studio, the first sort of like film purpose studios here in Singapore. And, you know, that spawned a whole lot of little cluster industries that have, you know, that have gathered around us. And we don't, we don't um, run the entire value chain completely. We bring in partners. And so you have sort of like everything from the camera equipment, the crews, the catering, and, you know, it just, it just grows around it. So, you know, the, the film industry is notorious for, um, you know, blossoming other industries that supports it, but it has to be consistent. And as long as the incentives are communicated and, and, and run, you know, consistently, um, the message will get out there. And, you know, again, I, I think it's going back to the fact that incentives ultimately should create a, a, a churn, right, in which we're just making movies. Now, what we want to do is that we want to go to work every day making movies. You don't want to go to work every day thinking about making a movie or thinking how to negotiate and how treaties work or point systems and this and that. Obviously, that has to be discussed, right? But you want to get into a system that you're just making movies. That's what the business is all about. Good, bad, ugly movies, well, <laughs> doesn't matter. We're just making movies. Right? And that's how we grow the industry. Um, last question, and this is addressed to Chris and Norman. Uh, can Chris and Norman, oops, sorry, question. Can Chris and Norman share what are the challenges they face when they apply for incentives? This is more paperwork, like all the process of, I guess, thinking about making movies. <laughs> Uh, the kind of, the dreaded word in Australia is quaint. Qualifying Australian production expenditure. So it's like, you, know, you look at it and it's like, how do you get the maximum amount of this budget to qualify as Australian uh, production expenditure? Qualifying. Qualifying is the word. Because a lot of the stuff that you think is going to qualify doesn't. In fact, I'll just use uh, an example here. I did The Railway Man, and it was a co-production. And so we needed to cast a major star from Australia for it to qualify in terms of points. Uh, and so we were very lucky in the way that we had on one side, we had Colin Firth, who's the greatest living Englishman, as everybody knows. And then on the other side, we managed to get Nicole Kidman. However, Nicole Kidman does not qualify as Australian. 
And Nicole Kidman is paid the most, well, she's paid quite a lot of money, shall we say. So, um, and none of that money qualified as Australian expenditure. Um, because of the, f because of, well, I won't even go into it, because of, it depends where you live, doesn't it? You know? Unless you didn't live in Australia enough at the time, uh, it didn't qualify. So, um, you know, those are the kind of things that you have to deal with. You know, and it's not, that situation is not unique, it happens a lot. Particularly when you're dealing with stars, which you have to get in a film to get the rest of the money. Um, and they do qualify as Australian. But at the same time, you know, if you look at any of those major stars, most of them spend a lot of time in America. And as a result, probably don't qualify in terms of expenditure as uh, qualified. So um, that's, those are the kind of things that are, are the most complicated and the most difficult in terms of actually you know, getting the maximum amount from these, these rebates and making sure that everything fits together perfectly. Well, mine is only one film there right now. We're going to production in January. So uh, not much of a challenge, but it's just the processing time uh, that was involved. And I think that I think for any foreign productions to shoot in Malaysia, they've got to allocate time for that processing and for you to actually really know whether you're going to shoot in Malaysia or not and whether you're going to get any kind of uh, qualified Malaysian spend uh, and what percentage you get, you've got to allocate some time for that. So the issue is time. At the end of the day, if you want to shoot three months down the road or even six months, I mean, they, they anticipate delays. Uh, because the thing is, sometimes you know, for you to get the maximum out of, out of incentive, uh, you got to, to allow that, that time process, the process, uh, uh, process uh, the time for, for the for the agencies to process your application. But other than that, when we talk about Malaysian content, I think uh, as far as doing uh, Malaysian content for the global market, I, I think to justify certain genre to actually go global is it's very difficult because right now we we produce our content in Malay language, as 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 far as local movies are concerned. So. Sometimes there's, there's a, a panel and one of the panels would actually ask questions, how do you think this movie will travel? So to actually answer that, you know, we don't really have a track record of Malay movies that really travel around the world. So it will take time at the end of the day. I mean, that's why, that's why the, the, the agency's got to believe that over a period of time, as we increase our production value, tell better stories, uh, and, and hopefully one day, you know, we can be like countries like Thailand, for example, who has been exporting content for a number of years. So I think those are the challenges. I think it's still early days for us. Uh, it's just been launched earlier this year, and, and we are one of the uh, first few who got approval. Uh, and I think over a period of time, it will, it will improve in terms of uh, the process, and hopefully the time, pro uh, processing time for applications will, will actually reduce, be reduced over a period of time. Thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing all the knowledge and experience in uh, production incentive. Give a hand to...